Finding God's peace in the middle of your storm. Again, preached the first part of it last week. Uh, if I, by the way, I'm going to give you a papal dispensation. If you've never had any storms and you don't think you're going to have any in your life, you can leave. That's fine. It's okay. Oh, come on. <laughs> Everybody has storms, don't we? Often we think, often I think, well, I'm the only one going through this storm. No. You know, there's a thousand other people just like you who are going through very similar storms. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes tells us. Uh, we all go through it, and life is a cycle. And yet, in the midst of that, we have the peace of Christ. And that's what we need to know. And that's where our focus needs to be. Finding the peace of Christ always helps if I turn it on. <laughs> Finding the peace of Christ in the midst of our storm. Christ is our peace. There is no other source of peace that is eternal that, is, that doesn't become dysfunctional. Every other peace becomes dysfunctional. And what were some of the last words of Jesus? My peace I leave with you. Not as the world give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Oh, am I the only one this week who had a troubled heart a couple times? You know, let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Don't give in to fear. What does he say? I give you my peace. We talked about different storms that have gone on. Harvey, Irma, late summer, wildfires, Midwest earthquakes, natural disasters of winds and water and earthquakes and fires and snow. Causes of them last week. Human causes, storms of controversy for doing what's right. You do what's right and you get in trouble for it. Uh, I once almost, Doug got arrested. True story. I was 18 years of age, a freshman in Bible college, went to New York City, went to Grand Central Station, was passing out gospel tracts. And in the midst of passing out gospel tracts, a huge Irish cop came up to me and said, son, you need to leave. Being a snot-nosed little brat, I was 18 years of age, and I said, I know my rights, I can pass out gospel tracts here. And he said, you got two choices. And he took me by the scruff of the neck. He said, you got two choices. One, leave peacefully. Or two, I arrest you. I said, I'm leaving. <laughs> I wasn't about to make a stance, you know. I mean, what did I know at 18 years of age? Uh, I was doing the right thing, but I created a controversy. Apparently, I was doing it in the wrong place. Grand Central Station was not the place to lead the world to the Lord. I, you know, who knew? Uh, uh, okay, storms of consequences Do, for doing what's wrong. We've all done stuff that was wrong and then had the results come back to haunt us. By the way, one I left out here, thought about it in the middle of this week, storms where other people do us wrong, and it hurts, and we didn't deserve it. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about this family. We didn't deserve it. They didn't deserve it. And yet, embroiled in the midst of a controversy. I walked out of the Brooks Hospital after seeing Ed yesterday and looked down at the little stand that has the newspaper there. And there on the front page was a picture of that man who it had been declared a mistrial. And I read what I could in the thing there, and I thought, what a travesty of justice. What a travesty. Uh, you know, sometimes we're not the ones who created the scene that was wrong. It's somebody else. You know, had that conversation with one of my kids this week for about an hour. Just because it's your right to make a decision or a choice doesn't mean your choice doesn't affect everybody else. Whew. And sometimes people, even those we love, make bad choices. And it affects us. You ever been there? <laughs> Tough place. Uh, types of storms we looked at last week. Just going to run through these financial, physical, emotional, relational, societal storms, culture wars, ideological storms, political wars. Uh, that goes on every day in Washington. I'm never surprised by it these days. Spiritual storms internally. We know what's right. We have the Holy Spirit. We're born again. We know what's right and struggle internally trying to do the right thing. I knew standing there 
you know, outside of that courtroom, I should be praising God. Oh, my spirit said, I don't want to praise God. <laughs> I want to grumble and complain, uh, you know, about the system. And, uh, yeah, I missed that opportunity. So I'm, I'm glad that later on they came back to it. Mentioned last week what David prayed and we pray at the same time. Every time we get in the midst of a storm, oh, that I had wings like a dove. For then I would just fly away. I'd leave all this behind and be at rest or at peace. I would hasten my escape. I can tell you right now, this family would hasten the escape from that in a heartbeat if they could. Uh, third, and we ended with this last week. Uh, 32 times in the Old and New Testament, the word storms or tempests come up. God wanted us to know, hey, you know what? No surprise. Life has storms, you know. Storms happen. Would you look at your wife, your mom, your neighbor, look at me if you don't have anybody sitting by you? This week, ask somebody to sit by you, you know. By the way, uh, yes, praying for Andy as well. We prayed before the service for Andy. He's being evaluated this week, and uh, Hart going through some tough times and may have to go, uh, is it Pitts Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh. Uh, his heart's not working right, so please pray for him. She and I already prayed before the service, but uh, and, or he'd be here. That's what I was thinking. He'd be here if he was up. He was in men's Bible study yesterday. Loved having him there. Said he's coming back. Storms happen. We can't always prevent the storms. As I talked with one of my kids, you can prevent some of them just by living right. If you find yourself always embroiled in storms all the time, and especially if you find that you're blaming everybody else for your storms, guess what? They're probably of your origin. <laughs> but if you find that, uh, you know, you have occasional storms, that's life. That's what life is like. Storms happen. We can't always prevent those storms. But we can be prepared for them and we can grow and we can benefit from the storms we go through. Josh shared yesterday with the men how that Jesus suffered greatly. And the scriptures are very clear that if our Lord suffered, who should we think we are that we wouldn't suffer? Of course we're going to suffer at times. Number one, we're human. So there's going to be some suffering going on. In a broken, dysfunctional world, we're human, and so there'll be some suffering. Uh, but sometimes we suffer for righteousness' sake. Uh, uh, you know, there are those around the globe who are persecuted for their faith every single day. Men and women who are in prison for doing nothing more than declaring that Jesus Christ is the Lord of their lives every day. For decades, some of them have been in prison. We need to pray for them. We can be prepared and we can grow through those storms. How do we get prepared for the storms of life? It's so simple and it's so hard. I put those together intentionally. It's simple. You want to know how to prepare for a storm? Turn your life over to Christ. I don't mean for salvation. I don't think there's anybody here in the sound of my voice who isn't born again, who hasn't received Christ, and because of that, Jesus lives within them. But I mean to take that step where you say, God, you are the sovereign Lord of my life, and you can do whatever you want with my life, and I will love you. I may not always understand it, but I will love you in the middle of it, and I will seek to praise you talking about praises this morning and how important it was to, to make the decision to praise. Many times I've shared with you that in the Old Testament when God sent Israel out to war against their enemies, they were facing life and death in war. And often they were, you know, 10,000 versus 150,000. And God would send them out to war. And God always said to them, send the choir first. Well, you thin your choir out real quick. <laughs> we 
We're going to go to war. Choir, you first. You know? Why? Because the high praises of God bring victory. And so in the midst of those tough times, we need to lift up the name of Jesus because he's the one. Remember the story of Aaron and Hur as they wanted to, uh, went out to do Israel, went out to do battle. Uh, and they literally, God literally told uh, two of the individuals there, and I think Hur was one of them, uh, Aaron and, and Hur, to stand on the side of Moses, one on either side, and to lift up his arms. That was the day the sun stood still for a long time. And as long as they held Moses' arms up, Israel won the battle, and when his arms would get heavy and he dropped his arms, they'd start to lose the battle. Why do you see your pastor? It's not that I'm weird. Well, I can't say that. Maybe I am. But why do I lift my hands when I worship? Because I'm telling Jesus, number one, I surrender, and I love you. After all you've done for me, I love you. I don't care who knows. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter. And I, I wasn't always that way. Trina and Dave, I remember you sitting in the tabernacle. We're talking 30, 40 years ago now. I don't know. Sitting on a Sunday night in the tabernacle, and you're sitting down there, and Pastor Tommy Reed, I did not want to be up on that platform. I, and he had a thing about if you're a pastor and you're in this building, you will sit on the platform. And I was pastoring here then. And he put me on the platform, and I didn't know how to raise my hands. I was like, you know, oh, yeah, praise you, Jesus, you know. And then I got to, thank you, Jesus. And, you know, they, I bet, well, maybe they don't remember. I remember. When the Spirit of God began to touch me, I just sit there and bawl. I didn't want to be on the platform anyway. And I'd sit there and bawl like a baby the whole service. And say, oh, God, don't make me do this again. Sunday night after Sunday night. What God was saying to me is, Gordon, let me break your heart. Let me let you feel what I feel. Let me teach you what it means to surrender. And some of those tears were just, oh, God, I don't think I knew what it was to surrender. I surrender, God. When my hands go up, it's praise, it's worship. You know, in the Old Testament, they said, lift up your holy hands. We sing a song about that. They told them to take the waves of grain, uh, you know, the first fruits, and to wave it before the Lord. And sometimes I'll wave my hands before the Lord. That's the first fruits of my praise. First day of the week. He deserves my praise on the first day of the week. You know? If that embarrasses you, your pastor does it, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I'm weird. Uh, maybe in other areas, but let me tell you something. I love God with all my heart. Not perfect, long way from it. But he will know my praises. And I lift my hands while I'm shaving. You know, it's hard, to, but it's hallelujah. <laughs> Listening to praise and worship music, you know, while I'm shaving in the morning, praising him. Because the praise goes before the victory. If you want to turn around in your life, start praising God. You don't have peace, start praising God. Go to battle praising God, and you'll find the peace of God in the midst of that battle. So <clears throat> how do we get prepared? By saying, God, my life is yours. Do you remember a 15, 16-year-old girl by the name of Mary? And an angel came to her and said, guess what, Mary, you're pregnant. Now, that wasn't unusual for 15-year-old, you know, Jewish girls in that day. They often, I've been in cultures, even in my lifetime, down in Haiti in the Dominican Republic, where if they're not married by 13, they think something's wrong with that girl, you know. You and I look at that and say, oh, my gosh, you know, that's sick. It's a cultural thing. But what did Mary say? When the Holy Spirit got done saying, that which is birthed in you is born of the Holy Spirit. Meaning Christ in you is birthed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not the power of Joseph, but the power of the Holy Spirit. What was her response? 
Be it unto me according to your will, O Lord. I pray that prayer as every day I can think of it. And the heart of that prayer is a part of my life every day. Lord, be it unto me. I don't know what he's going to do. I know what I want. I know what I think. But I immediately tell him, God, what I want is not always so smart. (laughs) Don't give me what I want. Give me what you want for me. Does that make sense? Give me what you want for me. So by turning our lives over to God, our Creator, and then resting in Him, trusting, that's so hard. I confess to you, I struggle with that rest thing. You come to weeks like this, and you get in the middle of that week, and you think, oh, my word. And yesterday was nonstop from 8 o'clock in the morning till about, I don't know, 10, 30, 11, well, it was later. By the time I got done studying for this, it was after midnight. Just nonstop. And it was crisis. It was life and death. It was people who, you know, who might step into eternity. It, it, that's what... That's what the pastoral life is. It's a great life. But some days it'll wear you out. You know? Can you rest in the middle of that? Resting. So that he can get us through the storms of life. The Lord God alone is the master of the storm. We tend to think God is somehow amazed that there's a storm in our life and we cry out to him and and he says, oh, gee, I didn't notice. I'm sorry. Let me come help you with that storm. He creates the storms. Say, what? Wait a minute. Let me understand your theology, Gordon. Please do. Please do, and with the next couple of slides, we'll help you to do that. But what does the Word of God say in Psalm 107, verse 25? He, who he? Who's he? God. God commanded and raised the stormy wind. God did it. And lifted the waves of the sea. God did that. But he's, David's not just talking about the storms of the seas, literally, though he is. He's talking about the storms of the waves in your life and in mine. So well, why is God allowing this? Oh, because he's so smart. He knows what will bring us blessing in the end. And then what happened? God puts us in the middle of a storm, and we cry out. I love it preached to you last week about, you know, the disciples in the boat and Jesus sleeping and, and, you know, they shake him and wake him up and say, don't you care that we perish? And he says, peace be still. And then they looked at, he looked at them and said, why didn't you do that? You know what? He's asking you and me that all the time. Babies cry. And I don't mean to be disrespectful, but babies cry. Mature people take charge. Babies can't do a thing about the circumstances they're in. Baby Christians understand you've got to cry out. And so they cry out to God and say, Lord, save me. Mature believers say, God, I know who you are. I know your voice. I know what your word says. I remember what you've done for me. Lord, thank you before it happens. Thank you that you're going to take care of that situation. (sighs) Thank you. So then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. Nothing wrong with that. But God wants us to move beyond that. And who brought them out? He. Who he? I'm being silly. God brought them out. God brought them out. Out of their distresses. Who stilled the storm? To a whisper. Who did? The same guy who spoke the storm into existence. In the last verse. Remember the last verse? He commanded and raised the stormy wind and lifted the waves of the sea. God did that. And then it says, and then he stilled the storm that he made to a whisper. And the waves of the sea were hushed. 
hushed. There's a phrase I want you to... I, years ago on a Wednesday night Bible study, I taught this. There probably weren't more than three here, but it was important then to understand, and it's important now to understand. Storms are... First, we want to say chaotic. You understand the word chaotic. When a storm hits your life, it's like all moorings are off, and you're tossed, and you're turned, and you don't know what's happening, and everything you think you knew isn't there anymore. And sometimes everything you think you knew about God isn't there anymore. Now it is, and we've got to resort all that out by going back to the Word and the Scriptures. But storms are chaotic, and they just rip your life apart. Remember the, the Greek word thuos, which meant to slay? The name of the storm is thuos. Storms look at you and they say, I will slay you because they come from the enemy. Uh, and I, I, You say, well, wait a minute. Didn't you just say they came from God? I understand that. If you go back and you look at the book of Job, all those bad things that happened to Job, where did they come from? You say, well, they came from Satan. Yeah, that's true. Because of a dialogue between Satan and God. But God said, yeah, you can create that storm, but you can only go so far. You can only go so far. And then you're done. So when you look at it, you know, sometimes, I, I'm not being silly now, sometimes I don't know whether to rebuke the devil or praise, and then it comes back to you, you probably need to praise God. Because in the middle of the storm, God is the one who's in charge, not Satan, even though he thinks he created the storm. Amen? Okay. So storms are chaotic, and I put the word there, chaotic. Can you see the word order in there? When God wants to restore order, he brings a storm. What? Hang on. Think this through with me. When God wants to create order, he creates the chaos of a storm. So what are you talking about, Gordon? Uh, my grandkids and I, my son, we're watching good, healthy TV on Friday. It was great. It was actually it was Bill Nye, the Science Guy, but it was, uh, you know, which I don't agree with Bill on on everything, especially creation. But it was a good program. It was about how volcanoes erupt, and I, I heard this, and I said, "Did he really say that?" He said, "It's amazing that." And they were looking at pictures of Mount St. Helens erupting. And you remember when Mount St. Helens erupted and the ash and the dust covered states. I think six or seven states at least were deeply covered in that ash. And they said scientists came back and said within a matter of two to three years, life that had not grown in those areas, even microbiotic life that hadn't grown in those areas for decades or centuries, started to grow. I've heard the same thing about forest fires. So oh, all those awful forest fires destroying. Listen, God brings life out of death all the time. It's who he is. It's who he is. He started that with a flood here. He said, I, I need to clean house. And he redid the whole population of earth through a flood. Storms are chaotic, but God means your storms to be chaotic, which means he's bringing order out of the chaos of the storm. So we look at the chaos and we think, oh, God, what a mess. Nothing good can come of this. And God says, oh, no, 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 I've got order planned in this. Wait till you see me reestablish order through what I'm doing here. In the middle of the storm, God says, you can have my great peace and my great purposes. I'm learning to say in every area of my life, I'm learning to say, God, I want your purposes fulfilled, not mine. I know what my purposes are. Not necessarily bad purposes, but God says, I, I, I have better purposes for you. Okay. You surrender, Gordon? I surrender. I know what surrender means. You know, why do we use this sign for surrender? Because it's the international sign of surrender. You go to a battlefield, and if you see the enemy put up their hands, what does that mean? Surrender. 
if you have any conscience, you don't shoot somebody with their hands up. God says, I recognize that surrender. I see that. And I'll bless that surrender. There is never a Sunday morning service that I start in this church, and there hasn't been for 20 years, and for the seven years in the 70s, that I didn't begin by saying, God, I surrender this service. It's yours. Do what you want. It's not mine. It's yours, Lord. We have his great peace and his great purposes. Psalm 119, 165. God says, I'll give you a little bit of peace. Is that what it says? Hmm. Great peace have they which love your law. I have another son. Some of you know him. He pastored here for three years, Jim. Jim made some unwise decisions and wound up in a psychiatric unit in Buffalo for seven months really had no sense of reality whatsoever. Messed his life up for a long time. Folks, choices have consequences. Do you understand that? Choices have consequences. I had lunch yesterday, and I do weekly with my son, Jim. He's pastoring the Sheridan United Methodist Church. I've never seen him more godly, more spiritual, more on fire for God. And I compliment him regularly. I said, Jim, what are you doing? He says, Dad, I'm in the Word all day long, every day. I've never seen him more at peace. Wow. I've never seen him more emotionally stable and mature and caring about other people. Why? He's in the Word constantly. Lives in the Word. He's quoting Scripture to me. I'm thinking, where was that one? I don't remember that one. You know? Loves the word. He's discovered this. We didn't talk about this yesterday, but <clears throat> great peace have they which love your law. You live in the word, you will have great peace. And that's where Jim is at. And he, it goes on to say, and nothing shall offend me. If you're in the word, nothing shall offend you. You get offended. People do things. You know, what they do that for? That wasn't right. I don't like that. Or something unnerves you and you're offended at that, God says, you know what? If you're offended, you probably haven't been in the Word enough. Oh. But I have a right to be offended. Yeah, but it'll kill you. God says, I don't want you to be offended. Those who love the Lord will have nothing offend them. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me, Christ, you may have what? Peace. Now he says, don't forget, I recognize that in the world you will have trouble. Don't be surprised that there will be trouble and chaos and difficulties. He said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. Take heart because I, the Lord Jesus Christ, have overcome the world. The word peace in the Hebrew is the word shalom. It simply means wholeness. Peace just doesn't mean, well, peace be to you. It's may wholeness be about you, body, soul, and spirit. May you be at peace and at rest and whole, body, soul, and spirit. That's what peace is. It means wholeness. It means being together. Stepping out of a, into a store, into a register line yesterday, and there was another woman standing close behind me, and I didn't know, I think it was Walmart, and I didn't know who she was, but the lady said to me, well, how are you two today? And, and I, I was a little stunned, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and I think she figured she was all of a sudden, she was too close. And I said, oh, we're not together. And then the lady looked at me like, what, you don't want to be with me? <laughs> And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I said, I have a hard time being together just by myself. I'm not always together. And then they all laughed and they got it and lightened the situation. But the word peace means you're together. You got it together. You're not falling apart in the midst of the storm. Uh, a rain means a state of rest, quiet rest, quietness. Order, chaotic. Order, contentment, harmony. 
Folks, it's our choice. It's our choice. We can either love God and receive His peace, or we can be angry with God and angry with man, and I was this week. I've confessed to you, I was. I was angry with jurors, and four jurors, and I was angry with you know, a judge, and uh, how could he let that happen, and all the evidence was there, and I don't understand this, and, and I was out of shape inside. God said, worship me. You know, be angry with God and with man, and you'll lose the peace of God, guaranteed. Ultimately, it's about, and this is it, it's about surrender of control. Why do I praise God? Because surrender is the quickest, easiest, and best path to peace. When you say, God, you got it all, and I don't. There is a God, and I'm not him, you know. <laughs> uh, and at 2 or 3, I'm going to slide right through them real quick. First Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let, that's a command, you, let, let the peace of Christ Rule, which in the Greek means literally umpire your heart. Some of you know sports well. What's an umpire do? As long as things are going well, he just lets the game go on. When the, when the, uh, the game isn't going well, he either throws the flag up in the air for football, blows a whistle for basketball or whatever. All of a sudden, the game stops. And God says, let the peace of Christ umpire. Just keep living, keep living. Don't worry. Don't be filled with anxiety or fear. Just do it. Do what God tells, uh, tells you to do. And if something is wrong, he'll blow the whistle. He'll bring it to a stop. Okay? Let the peace of Christ umpire in your heart. Two in closing. I love this. For now, and the next verse is for eternity. For now... The Lord of peace himself will give you his peace always. Wow. He'll give you his peace always, John. Always. And then he goes on to say, by all means, and I included in there, even by storms. He'll let those storms come into your life. Now, that's for now. He'll give you his peace always. And we're going to close with this, Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace, I love this, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan. I get so sick and tired of people being beat up by the enemy, by Satan. Uh, even my own family at times. Yeah, they make, as I do, uh, bad decisions at times, which have consequences. We all do. But beyond that, Satan's at work. He's at work big time. Our final promise from God today on peace is that the very God of peace himself shall bruise Satan under your feet. I like that. Under your feet. Not the Apostle Paul's, not Jesus. Under your feet. You are going to take that Satan and you're going to bruise him. And then he adds that one word there and I close with this. Shortly. Soon. Satan's going to get his comeuppance. Soon. Can't come soon enough for me. <laughs> Amen?